Hi everyone, uh, welcome. It's lovely to see you. It's lovely to see so many of you um, in three dimensions after a long time um, in two. Although it was so welcome to those people who are elsewhere in the world watching us via a live stream. So there is a much bigger audience out there too. Um, so welcome to the annual artist's talk that we hold here at the Court of, which has been organised by Pierre Gottschall, my colleague, and myself, Jo Acklin. And this is on behalf of the Sculptural Processes Group, which is a, um, a group of researchers, curators, academics, students, who um, all work and think together across a very diverse group of objects um, to think about um, sculpture and its materials and processes. And the activities of the group are very generously funded by McQueen's Flowers. And we are delighted that this year's lecture is being delivered by Francis Richardson, a sculptor whose work we admire enormously. And it was the um, recent focus of a solo exhibition in London, which some of you may also have been lucky enough to see. If not, we'll be hearing about that this evening. Um, Francis received her MA in Fine Art Sculpture from the Royal College of Art in 2006. Prior to this, she had studied sculpture in Nigeria, and she also received her BA in the Fine Art from Norwich School of Art and Design. She has exhibited nationally and internationally, and there are a number of solo exhibitions. You can find out about all of these on her uh, very beautiful webpage. Um, and that includes the most recent show, um, If I Measure It Must Exist. It was at Carsten Schubert in 2021. In 2021, the same year, Richardson was awarded the Brian Robertson Award and had previously been the recipient of the Mark Tanner Sculpture Award and the Kiara Williams Contemporary Art Solo Award, both of those were in 2017. She was nominated for the Max Mara Art Prize for Women, which um, is in collaboration with the White Chapel Gallery. It's a very uh, brief um, condensation of a very, very impressive CV. I just wanted to, to uh, briefly introduce her so I can hand over and we can hear more from her. And just to let you know how the evening's going to run, Frances is going to open the two very short films that she's made. After that, she's going to be giving us um, a lecture talk. Um, after that, uh, Pia and I um, will join Frances and we will open up and we'll have a discussion among ourselves. I know sometimes in lecture theatre it doesn't feel very conducive to just kind of joining in and... Uh, keeping it kind of informal and so on, but we, we hope that you uh, do join in in that spirit and um, we keep it as informal as possible. But before then, I'm going to hand over to Francis. Hello. <laughs> I have to get used to the microphone. Um, just want to say thank you to Joe and Pia for inviting me to do the talk. Um, I'm going to set off with two short videos, only three minutes each. There, um, one, the first one is of, um, I made as a kind of, I don't, I don't really have people in the studio because um, it's a quite private place and it's terribly messy and I think it may give a bad impression. <laughs> um, so, but I made a short video for the um, Brian Robertson Trust um, Award, and then the second video is a walkthrough uh, made on my iPhone, and I didn't kind of, it was just made for my own personal um, remembering of, of walking through the exhibition, um, and so it's a bit jiggly if you can put up with it, but I thought it would be good to show because um, the static pictures of the work don't really represent what it's like to go and see the show. Um, then I'm going to talk about three, piece, three pieces of work that um, um, kind of persist in my mind and crop up quite often. Um, and then I shall show some pictures of static pictures of the work and show and maybe give a little bit of insight into the thoughts and processes behind them. So, um, I can shut up now. I haven't got over the fear of the mic. I can <laughs> shut up and have six minutes of not talking. <laughs> Exhibition concept me from what may be seemingly distant starting points in the studio. 
sometimes, like with these veneers, um, they've been hanging around for maybe a year, two years, and then suddenly they'll come into play. They're incredibly thin, fragile and brittle. Styx is a Greek goddess and also the name of the river that forms the boundary between the earth and the underworld. Lachesis is known as the measure of the thread of life and Atropoc is the cutter of the core.
foundations of the door. <laughs> so the first piece of work I wanted to bring to inside this room is um, Duchamp's three standard stoppages. Um, there's a description I think I read at the time when I first saw it. A straight horizontal thread, one metre, falls, one metre long, falls from a height of one metre onto a horizontal piece of black canvas, twisting as it pleases. It creates a new image of the unit of length. Um, this act is repeated and <coughs> the piece itself shows three strings on the black canvases placed on glass slides with the label stoppage one, stoppage two, stoppage three. And there are three rules which have a side cut out um, using the line that the string made as the template. And these pieces live inside the box. So the ready-made here is the idea of a standard meter. And um, I think why it intrigued me is because I've been looking and thinking about measurements very much to the sculpture and the body and how we use the hand and the foot and these are visible, you know, and we are still there in our everyday kind of relationship with the world around us. But um, I kind of asked myself, what's a meter? And I think Duchamp can't believe that he didn't understand when making this piece uh, or wasn't aware of the cultural impact that the idea of um, creating a meter had on the country of his birth, which is France. And this is um, one of the provisional meters um, that are held in the archive of the uh, metro, there's archives, the archive of the meter. Um, <clears throat> it's an amazing story, and I, you know, as I got into it, I realised, you know, I can't, I can't tell the whole story. I wish I could, but um, the the beginnings of it come with the French Revolution, which saw the national assemblies um, abolishing aspects of the ancien regime. And, one, and there was a need to regulate weights and measures for international trade. And discussions were underway between France, the USA, and um, the UK, Britain, at the time. Um, along with the kind of idea of the, the Cultural Revolution in France, you know, they wanted it to be for all men and of the world. So it was decided that the length of a metre would be one ten millionth of a quarter of the meridian, which is the distance between the pole and the equator. Um, pretty quickly, the US and uh, Britain backed out, partly to due to political, the, the political instability of France and the fear of that, but also France was very um, compelled to measure the meridian through Paris. And this was <laughs> so, so the whole history of the meter is beset and, and with problems. And it, it's a search for an ideal which is based on a kind of human I ideal, but also the uh, it, you know it's it's about government and rule and regulation as well. So there's even a conflict in, in the in this ideal. As I understand it, and I and I kind of think think about Duchamp and his anti-war kind of mindset, and um, his you know I think I think there's there's a lot embedded and there's a lot to unpack in this work more than I can say in this lecture. Um, the history it travels over two hundred years, 
Revolution War, diplomatic relations, human error. Can you believe that the two guys who set off, um, one of them miscalculated and then tried to hide his calculations from the other and then got guilty and then tried to reveal them and, um, and, then, and then he died of yellow fever. So there's all this, you know, there's a, there's a huge story. And, but the calculations went through. So um, even today, the one that's, the, the meter as we know it, now and is used within experiments and things like that, which is based on on the speed of light, which is seen as a constant. Uh, um, there may be another amendment in four hundred years' time; we never know. Um, but that the this kind of um, is is based on a miscalculation right from the beginning. You know, just kind of, anyway, this this is the, this is the last standing meter um, that they were put around in Paris, I think there were 16 or 19 of them, they were set into the walls of Paris um, two years after the 1787 well, revolution, 1789 I think it is, well, is it? Oh, the dates in there are different, um, but um, anyway they were installed around the streets of Paris and this is the last one that, that remains. Um, and they were for people so they could understand what a meter was. But it's not perfect. That's a... Joe will understand that joke. <laughs> it's a word that I struggle over. Um, so, um, so when I come back, coming back to this piece, um, I think the way I look at it or reflect upon it um, is with that it actually reflects upon the fallibility of ideas when faced with material realities. Ideals, sorry, when faced with material realities. Enter Jasper Johns. So, um, I, I can Looking at this, um, what we have here is an object that's an image of an object. That's if it was on the table. What we have here is an image of an object, which is an object that's an image of an object. Oh, but you understand, let's imagine it's on the table. Um, just for John's new Duchamp. And the question I kind of come to when looking at this is, why make such a thing after the ready-mades of Duchamp? Why go back to this making an image of something? Um, and what does an image of something have that the original object doesn't? Uh, it's just a bowl, after all. But, it's not just a bulb. Um, when we look at this, it's a bulb that plays with the word idea, first of all, so it kind of starts to lead us down the path. What I see in this piece is a careful encasement, as if a skin has been drawn over the original. Is the original bulb inside? And that question I asked because there was a light, um, a torch that Jasper Johns made, that with this material sculpt metal, he painted over the torch and left the glass front with the bulb exposed. So I'm already bringing memories of other things into the equation of looking at this piece. But the catalogue in the exhibition says it's not. Um, but that how, that's how it feels to me, and I imagine the original may be broken inside, and if shaken, it may rattle. Um, he made several bulbs over a period of time, and um, and the first one came after seeing the Jasper John, I mean the Duchamp collection in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, they were all fabricated quite differently, but this is the one that I'm attracted to in particular. So I think anyone not having the knowledge of a real bulb, imagine came to it without, without ever having seen a bulb. 
I think you'd be hard pressed to understand the material qualities and the use of the original form of this object. You wouldn't know that it had, it came from something else. Um, but we're asked from the form to measure, and I'm dropping that word kind of as a, as a kind of the way that I think about making work, as a form of measurement, to measure this object against our memory or the memory of a bulb. He asks us to, we are asked when looking at this piece from the form to measure this object against our memory, if we have one, of a bulb. But beyond the form, its surface offers something other than the image we care to remember. Looking, back, looking at this bulb, I reflect on the writings of um, Karen Barad, a quite serious physicist, although some male physicists uh, um, don't think she is that serious. Um, and I came across her writings first um, in a booklet, a pamphlet that she wrote for documentary in 2012 called uh, What is the Measure of Nothingness? And I also used a quote for her for the Mark Tanner exhibition, which is not even nothing can be free of ghosts. And that was for a title of the exhibition there. Um, the quote refers to the act of measuring <coughs> by which the measured and the means by which it is measured. It would help if I put my glasses on, wouldn't it, if I was sort of resort to reading the sort of notes. <laughs> um, the quote refers to the act of measuring by which the measured and the means by which it is measured become entangled. Although this entanglement is not explicit, but resides in the spectre, um, in, resides like a spectre. So I go back to this object and thinking, in measuring an object in a material other than the original, <clears throat> that intentionally does not mimic the original, do we create an entanglement of the real and the imagined? Is the real bulb we is the real bulb we can't see now a ghost and the object we do see something in and of itself? And the um, third work in the ring is this um, section of the frescoes in the um, church in um, Assisi, or what you call it, Assisi Cathedral, or I don't know, I visited it. Anyway, this is a picture, and it's, um, I suppose it's like a reportage painting in a way. There was an earthquake in Setsa, and um, the story goes that a boy died in the, in the um, in a, in a wreckage, and he was pulled out of the wreckage and um, placed, as you do with dead people, what you call it, out, laid out. And um, the miracle was, the miracle, one of the miracles of um, Francis of Assisi is that the next morning he was alive. So I didn't know the story when I first came across this, but what I was intrigued about was this, um, the, the position of this building and for me, the image taken looking at the interior collapse of building seemed far more um, evocative of uh, the emotion. It's like a physical um, presence of, of, of an expression of, an, of a psychological state of the mourners uh, or what you, know, what you must be feeling at that point of, of when someone dies. Um, so, I, yeah, and, it, and it's a one-to-one -one thing. Whereas if I look at the group of mourners, I'm, I'm very much like an onlooker or a spectacle, but if I look at the building, I, it, it looks back inside of me in that way. It was a physical thing. So those are the three works. Now come on to the exhibition. Um, 
I was invited to a show in the um, in room two, and we walked through the gallery, the space. It's not a typical gallery space. In fact, it was a breakout room um, for the uh, for Carsten Schubert, really, and. Um, I visited shortly after his death, and these are two photographs I took at the front and back room. And what's noticeable is that the light in both rooms are, is completely different. The front room has an outlook to the sort of Soho, the surface Soho that we all know, and the back room has the outlook that we saw in the video of. Um, sort of an, an unusual so of the, the back side. Um, and it's a lot darker and has different kind of lights. So, and when I was, um, I suppose I spent, spent a day, I think, just hanging out in this space. And sometimes you think an image will come to you or something will come to you. The only image that came to me was, a, was the idea of a cat running around it, kind of running itself on things. And I had to, you know, you can think, oh, gosh, you know, where am I going with this show? But um, I kind of sat with it. It kind of tried to trust these things. And it, it kind of evolved into this, this, this feeling, if I could express it, was of being full and empty at the same time. So that was the kind of key thing that I was working with. Um, so, yeah, so full and empty at the same time. And again, um, on a series of, you know, where do you start the show? I look back at things and I've been taking photographs of, of piles. I think during the beginning of lockdown, a lot of people were doing up their houses. I actually, outside my window, um, there's an almost permanent skip because the, all the flats are being redone in my block. So I'm faced constantly with this kind of outpouring of uh, domestic detritus, you know. And sometimes, not every time, but sometimes you see a pile that has a kind of monument, monumental feeling, you know. Like, and um, I really wanted to, um, well, the title, um, in attempt to deny their mortality. Um, I don't know whether, yeah. What, do I have to say anything about that? Probably not. But that is the title of them. I didn't know it was my attempt to deny their mortality. Um, but in rendering them in um, ink was, was a decision because of the permanence of the medium. And it also brought a risk to the actual rendering of the image. Um, you can't erase ink, you can't go over it, you can't, you know, like, well, you can go over it, but you can't lift it off like a watercolour, you know. So there's a tension there when painting these piles, and I kind of feel the tension of the pile maybe collapsing at some point, the little balance and things like that. So I think when I'm actually doing the work, the medium actually informs a kind of level of concentration and, um, uh, yeah, whatever it is, a relationship with the, with the image itself. Um, and, um, yeah, painting shadows. I realised through that process that, you know, a lot of people talk about um, capturing light in things. And I realised that I wasn't capturing light, I was capturing the shadows um, in the work. So the drawings I knew um, would work in the front room, but that scuppered my first idea for the show, which was to have a drawn pile of rubbish. Um, so that's that. So I was continuing to make work in the studio and then um, Sort of honouring the space and the light in the space, I kind of tried to make the front room more of a um, sort of a, a place that was a welcoming, a reception, 
was kind of there and using the fireplace and the um, and the, the kind of structure of the room table that was already there. Got rid of a lot of things, but I just wanted to nod to that as a thing. And the um, back room um, is something else we we'll probably get to. Um, I brought in quite a lot of objects, not all of them survived the kind of in store, but these two found their home quite quickly. They're made of copper and um, the, the original form that it comes from, you may have noticed when I, in the start of the videos, you know those plastic loops that go around newspapers, it's that kind of Thing. That's the original form, and I was just become fascinated by the way when you find them, they're crushed. And I thought there must be a mathematical kind of system here of taking a circle and flattening, taking an upright loop like that, and when it flattens and the angles and everything. So I spent quite a long time on the um, computer kind of vector thingy, doing the whole thing, thinking, yeah, I'll get this perfect, I'll get this absolute perfect, and I can send it off and I can have it watercolor. So the angles will be absolutely right, and then I can get someone to do the soldering, and and I'll make this perfect kind of thing. Um, and um, of course, it didn't work like that. The fabricator's version, he sanded off this and things, and was making it look nice, and it's just like ooh, so frustrating. So these are two that I made myself, um, and they're full of imperfections, a bit like measuring a meter. Um, when I hung them up on the nail, there was an option, I brought the nail with me to the space, I wasn't sure, but I noticed in the studio when I hung them up, sometimes they would just rock for hours, and they kind of act like a pendulum or a timekeeper, and it was kind of romancing a bit. Um, this is another piece that was on the thing, you can skip to this one. If I measure it my sticks, is this is my ruler for the show, and often I, I take sticks into spaces to, um, and then I take them back to the studio because the scale of different spaces is quite deceptive. So I can find if I can take some an object into a space, and then take it back to the studio, I have this artifact that gives me a memory of a, of the scale of something or how it's going to appear in a space. This is, um, it has its history, and I like this, I don't know, it's, it's a kind of, it, I, I, this, the piece of wood was originally, uh, it's a stretcher um, thing, it's the wood that you use for painting stretchers, and the students were all making stretchers, and this was um, far too bendy, no one wanted to use it, so I asked if I could have it, and the technician kept it for two years, bless him, in the, um, in the woodwork shop. And he said, look, you really, do you really want this, or can I get rid of it? And it was in one length, and my sort of struggle to take it back was, actually, as a thing in itself, it was perfect. You know, like it had this uh, beautiful carbon, in, and because it was so machine-cut, and then it was sort of bent into the machine-cut, I, I was kind of in love with it as it was, but I couldn't get it back on the bus or the tube, and, and I didn't, my knees were too bad to walk home with it, so... Um, which I would have done actually if I, if I thought. Anyway, as luck would have it, sort of many years down the line, um, well, two years he said he'd got it, and I said, okay, I'm going to cut it into three. Um, and that's an important, it was, it was a struggle making that decision and how to cut it and everything. And, um, but three is this kind of rhythm of the three, it's, uh, it's, it's, it has movement. And I thought, well, if I'm going to cut it, it's, gonna, it's got to change. So that was the first introduction and then the this you know when you have a measuring stick and you fold them out and all that I had one that unscrewed so the the idea of it being like a folding out one but it was never going to be practical because I did actually try to put hinges on it but it didn't work um, and it was never going to be a practical measuring stick so it's not it's it's it sort of became stuck folded um, it's got a bit of rigor to it um, and um, yeah, and the surface, I, 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 if you, if you, you, the grain informs you that, you know, the peats are actually cut and would line up if they were straight out. But the, I found the machine cut, I, I, the first thing I did, having cut the piece into three, was to just 
sort of work over it with the with the chisel. So just slowing myself down, slowing the piece down, slowing the surface down, that kind of thing. Just try and get to know it as it as it was. Um, how are we doing for time? I'm kind of getting there. So we've got like sticks. These were, I kind of call them the moths. I think here the material really informed the form of the piece and how they were going to exist in these things. And um, I call them things, they're, they're sort of. Anyway, I called I nicknamed the moths because the death's the death's head hawk's moth is named after these um, goddesses as well. So there's a there's a kind of knowledge and the idea of um, um, oh, I don't know. the moth that goes back to Virginia Woolf <laughs> and the moth in the window, which is something that I'm omitted from my notes. So the, the the idea of the sort of vibrancy of life and the the temporality of life she writes about and the um, the acceptance of death as well. So there's a kind of emotional kind of connection with this but it's kind of it's particularly came from looking at the images, this sort of raw shot type image that you get from looking at the birth of veneers and this idea of unfolded time and the memory of the way that memory works and unfolds and changes. And I call these um, real phantoms because they're not of anything, um, or but there there is a there is something there. I don't know. Um, so these are the three moths that were in the show. There's another one in the office. And then the works that I call the Phantom Reels are the two NDF works. This is object for thinking about empty. My mother kept on asking me what was I going to put in it. And I was like, oh, I think you missed the point. <laughs> um, and this one, Object for Thinking About Opium, which is a redrawing of the door that exists in the room itself. So, there we go. Great. Yeah? <laughs> Thank you. Um, shall I put the walkthrough? Yeah, we'll not do then, that. And then yeah. if you want to come and join us, and then we can have a um, thanks, Francis. Thank that was you. always it's always so interesting to hear you talk about your work. Um, Pia and I have had the the pleasure of doing that, um, and we've had conversations, and so we could do that and continue that conversation. But it might be nice, perhaps, if we just kind of open it and we can join in, and and if anyone from questions, comments um, that you would like to put to Francis, or that we could talk about today. Sasha. Thank you. Um, oh, you know what, Sasha? I think because this the street, we're going to bring up just oh, because it's good. being yeah. recorded. So if you could, thanks. I just wanted to say thank you uh, for that. Uh, just revealing talk, and um, it was so rich, and I was said there was obviously more to say on each subject. I just I love the approach of the fallibility of ideals and the material reality, and maybe. Kind of makes you, you know, one asks the question if you are obviously you're working at both levels, the, the ideas first, the materials first, and sound materials. And I just thought perhaps you could say a little bit more about that. Your talk has been about that as well, but I just wondered if, especially looking at those veneers and how you slotted them in, and I just wondered the interaction between this and the ideas and the, and the material and the, and the process. Yeah, I suppose, I suppose with the D-Shop, it's very much ideals, you know, this, this, um, this abstract, you know, like going into the abstract, something that is a pure, um, something very pure goes back to Plato, I suppose. And that, it, you know, like you can't, when you're dealing with um, an ideal, um, 
in, it, it's very difficult to sort of make it happen in, in reality um, because we're, we're only human in that way. <laughs> um, uh, I did slip up and say ideas and um, often when kind of preparing this thing, you know, it's like the, uh, the fallibility of ideas. I don't, I don't think I ever set off with an idea. In, in my practice, I don't, I don't come to it, and and actually, I've, I sort of instinctively have responded to those pieces. But I have to say, it's only in in being sort of challenged to to negotiate that instinct that I understand how much they've affected me, and um, in that in that way, and the the. So this, so, I mean, so this, so it's really interesting because this goes to the heart of something that I'm always um, asking and, and prodding you, which is this gap or relationship between, you know, is this a conceptual practice? Is this a very material practice? Is it somewhere between the two? You, you know, you're, you're not a conceptual artist, but you're about the materials, the stuff of making, but yet you're interested in the gap between this p perfect ideal and what happens? No, I'm not interested in the ideal. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in ideas and I get drawn into, into I, love, I love learning about things. Mm -hmm. I love understanding the world and, and, and my sculpture is about really trying to understand this world that we live in. So if you come across you know, like, and and that and that. So, in that way, you know, like, and I love knowing about the wood, and you know, I don't just accept that that grain as you know. Oh, it's beautiful. You know, like I want to know what it is, and the fact that this is a slice through time leads me to thinking about sort of the way that physics is now talking about time. We accept time as linear, but what if they were different? What if we were living in different? moments in time and it leads me into thinking I can't help it it leads me into thinking about these propositions so I think there is a link between you know like I can't look at stuff without asking what it is mm -hmm. and, and and where it's been and what its history was and da, 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 da. I think it's just a I mean, it's just a, you know I'm not just looking at the aesthetic I think that you're you're wonderful story about the meter really kind of for me is like very enlightening so it's mm -hmm. the apparent standard that is not and, and so on and maybe it's about precision I was thinking not so oh, about perfection in the yes. idea that it's about the uh, I asked you to take the word perfection out of the text you did and I did, <laughs> and I did of course because <laughs> I kind of think you know like that that for me that word perfection does go back to yeah. the the platonic the ideal. ideal and 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 language this is where I I I would never finish a book. I'm I'm surprised I managed to get a talk out because honestly, I had about f four hours of stuff on that ruler that I was thinking I've got to cut this down. I've got to cut this down. It just <laughs> taken me four days to reduce the the you know to actually talk about the the meat, to actually get something out. You know because because that you know so the, yeah. Yeah, I, I've it was about the making, thought. wasn't it? Yeah. It was because when um, you we were visited, we idea. were so intrigued by you were making the skip that <laughs> time we came to visit uh, you, and so I think in a way this kind of attention to detail, precision, and and that's different of a different order to the perfection, which takes you down that ideal. Yeah, but the precision, mm. the skip isn't it's measured against itself a lot of the time, and I suppose you know um, it's the drawing of a skip. Um, I measured about, I suppose this is a, it is an ideal, an ideal skip, because I measured um, about, I don't know, every skip I came across I was going to take measuring it and going, because the skip had to fit in the room, but it, it, you know, the door is measured, it's in the room with the thing, but the skip had this liberty that it could have and, and the playfulness that it could have um, to, there may be a skip out there. In fact, I took a photograph because the design of the side of the design of the skip is quite rare to find, but you do see that design. And I, and I saw one on the back of um, 
a lorry just as I came in here. I thought, oh, that's a good omen. You know? <laughs> There's a, um, but but it's the measurements of it are to the space, mm -hmm. and and the construction of it is to the to the material, the MDF material. Mm -hmm. um, so, in what way is it precise? That would be my. In what way is it perfect? It has so many different points at which it's not perfect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in terms of the. And the attainment of that isn't the goal here. Because oh, you no. talked also about things collapsing, tension, balance. I mean, things seem. In, in yeah, and I have in the past done like a collapsing I beam, and like it, yeah. it, the the mm, yeah the form is really about the expression and trying to do a piece that's quite vacant and um, maybe resisting an emotional right. a kind of resistance. Mm -hmm. um, it's big, very big, and very empty. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's. I'm sure we have more questions, but can I just um, start in with one? Mm. So the skip um, is made from MDF, and one of the things that one can't help notice is that your medium description says MDF and nails. Screws. Screws, sorry, yeah. screws. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, related to that, I also noticed that the, um, the metric measurements come first in the slides, and then the inches, which yeah, I think that's is like... That's the gallery. Oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> Anyway, okay, okay. I'll leave that but, aside. But that is a history of, of um, yeah. yeah. You know, the, the inches are now standardized by the metric. Although the, although the inches came first. Ooh, sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so back to the MDF, because when we were with you, um, we had, a, I think, a very interesting conversation about why you like MDF and mm -hmm. the different types of MDF you've worked with. And would you mind recounting a bit of that? So, reasoning why you choose it, you know, because you've got in one exhibition very precious seeming um, veneer and then the MDF, so there's quite a contrast there as well. Yeah, I think the material, the MDF, it, um, it's fabricated sheet that um, doesn't hold an image of of itself, unlike the wood that holds an image of itself and of time and things like that, the MDF for me is a bit is very raw. It's like a, it's it doesn't. I suppose it, it its size and scale has this production kind of thing, very much of the world in that way. But you, you, it, it's raw and and for me initially it was like finding a material that could work like an HB pencil. Mm -hmm. So it could be like a drawing. So it was, mm -hmm. it it didn't have content. It was contentless, and it was quite a challenge. You know, it's not a nice material, and it's quite a challenge to use a material that doesn't really have. Um, well, at first, it, I suppose the thing of it, it does, it's usually covered up. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's usually hidden. It's not left raw, mm -hmm. and 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 that. You know, and I started to see that as a quality rather than a deficiency. It became quality. You know, like so it would talk about exposure, and it would allow um, the the idea of exposing the making and and the and I love architecture drawings. You know, like that show all the measurements and the things and the the way things are put together, and they they expose all that you know, stuff. You know, like facades frustrate me. <laughs> I want to see in, I want to know how something's made yeah. and why it's made. Yeah. yeah. Well, with the skip, it's very clear how you put it together and so all the screws are visible. Are you a bit like Judd where you think about how the screws all relate to each other within the piece or does it not go? Um, yeah, my assistant will probably that I worked on with this, I actually let her screw them in, but she had to have instructions of how to screw them in, because you can go too far in, into the wood, so they, I, I, I need to be able to take the piece apart, so that's, mm -hmm. right, you know, it's a functional way of building something. Yeah. So, but yeah, I do like them to line up. Is so it, it's a form a, of precision then, <laughs> <laughs> isn't it? I mean, yeah, but if you look at them, there's the odd one that isn't, so, yeah. um, and that's the human, but it, 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 I think this is where I kind of 
relate to uh, John's in a way. There's there's always this. It alludes to something, but yeah. alludes it at the same time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to mm -hmm. shake that Jasper John's. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to do that. Um, right. Would anyone else like to to contribute anything? Hi. Um, just, I'm really intrigued by the drawings. Could you talk a bit more about the process of eliminating the background and sort of creating your drawings? Yeah, I suppose the, um, you know, in an attempt to deny their mortality, they become, um, and they're images of something that did exist. And I, I often question myself, well, why don't you just take a photograph? But um, it's not about them, it's not about this pile, it's really about the process of um, preserving it as a, 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 a memory, a visual memory or something, because they, won't ex they don't exist anymore, they're gone. You can't go back and see them, you can't. And, but a photograph is too direct to a kind of medium to, to do that and also memories, well my memories are never secured in in space so that's the elimination of the background. I Initial kind of objects that I started painting during lockdown, I think the first one had a shadow and I was like oh no, you know like because that leads it into a very much discourse about um, about representation mm -hmm. And, and, and just removing it um, brings up the question. Thank you. <laughs> um, and also a little bit about the material definition within them, because you can really read really different material qualities, I think. I mean, it's in and I'm very much thinking about the, the theory. Um, the feel of the metal. There's some. I the first. Um, I hadn't done a representational image of anything for years. I'd, hmm. I'd worked in pluses and minuses, um, a, a symbolic kind of thing, denial. You know, trying to get. And then I, I, I don't know. Through lockdown, I painted a bucket. I sent it to the gallery, and I said, "Who'd, who'd guessed?" You know, like. Kind of a joke to myself, but also it was a bucket that I knew when I left Wales at the beginning of lockdown, um, which is a place that I be go to often. I wouldn't hear that bucket for a while, and um, and I, and it, and the material is the noise of the bucket and everything like that. So um, it was for me like painting a, a memory of the bucket, and part of the memory of the bucket is its material existence. So. I was very aware when I'm painting even the things that, you know, of the material that I'm painting and how it, how it is and its structure. So I'm, I'm glad that it comes across. I don't know how it comes across, but I am when I'm painting a metal bracket, I'm very much remembering the materiality of that metal bracket. Thank you. That was another question. I think another person had a question. Pass that unless it went away. Um, I was just thinking about what you were saying about the, the drawings, paintings. When you said um, about the ink that you can't take away, um, I thought that was the most terrifying thing to do as you were progressing through them anyway. Because so, well, it's not extraordinary, so it must have been quite nerve wracking to get as you were doing them. That, but that, and that, I think maybe that tension's in there, but that's not what I was saying. Um, but just how they're, then they're accumulating, you know, they're sort of in the same way that the, the other, so they're like sculptures in a way. Mm. It reminds me of the Kilman. Graphite drawings as, as being very sculptural, so that their images 
but uh, something that you build up. Right. Yeah, painting the shadows and painting the shadows, it reveals the form. I thought about that, thought about them completely differently. You know, the cumulative layering of, of a material and then assisting as images and these extraordinary kind of materials sculptures at the same time. And the other thing I really love about the show is how. And he, when he talked about taking the stick home um, back to the studio to measure as something that you can like to be relative that you mm. can understand, but how you measure as an as a person in the exhibition, you feel yourself in relation to all those ob objects. And I didn't realise till I sort of left about that. And then you're mentioning about the stick and thinking, oh, that's what's going on. Because um, you, because you see yourself in relation to the marks, because the, you feel conspicuously kind of small, and with the stick you feel conspicuously big. And the, as you enter that building, you're very aware of yourself moving to a space because it's quite a strange, dark, totally kind of entrance. And I was just wondering about when you. It's that conscious thing to make us feel so conspicuous, even though I didn't realise I was talking conspicuous until afterwards. <laughs> but like that's sort of measuring with an object as well, being much more meaningful than measuring something like a meter or something that we agree on is always the same. It's actually not as useful as you know a body or a stick. I just love that way you. I think that's why I like sculpture. Yeah, I do think that, that, that the placement of the work in the space is relative to the idea of walking through the space. That's why it was really important to show that walk through. Like, um, because, you know, you can't... You, sculpture is an encounter, it's an experience, it's something that um, and it's fleeting often, you know. That I, so if you get the opportunity to live with things, um, your relationship changes, and it's so rich. But it, it's not often the case that we have that opportunity. But we do live in our, we do live with objects all the time, you know. I, I wish I was rich enough to buy sculptures that I could have a sort of massive thing and I could actually revisit them and revisit them and, and and get the same relationship I do with those things as I have with sort of tables and chairs and things like that. Alison, there's one down the front here. I, I thought the skip in room two was like a moss and I think I said that to you. So yeah. But what, what, um, what can you say about that? Like a moth. <laughs> is that it's landed somewhere? Maybe the darkness of it. Mm. The darkness is really important to me for it to have a dark interior, and the positioning of it in the room was relation to the light, and that's and I introduced the lights into the space because they attract moths. But no, not because they attract moths. But, but in order to get that darkness inside. You know, like because, um, yeah, it's it, it's big empty kind of thing. Why did you think they have a moth? Something, it's a shape. something about this dynamic, maybe, yeah. and the way that I don't know wings. Just mm. uh, I don't know. I mean, it kind of doesn't make sense, but um, perhaps it is. Like perhaps they're all moths. No, but I need to, I do know that it's, it's maybe because of the way it sits as well, because there's, um, it sits on two edges and there's a gap that runs right underneath the, the edge that it, it sits on, which creates a, a kind of levity. So although it looks really big, it has a really big and heavy, and that's the memory of skips that we kind of carry with us is the big, heavy skip, but the way it sits on the ground uh, you know, on the on the floor, 
with this sort of gap creates a lightness which perhaps isn't sort of something that we, you know, you, you um, intellectually kind of think, it's something that you you feel, it's like the shadow gap on walls and things like that, it's something that you just accept, but it does give a levity to it, and also the material and the, the, the way that the thing, the material has a, a lightness to it, even though it's quite heavy it has a light look to it, the way the, the it's made with, you know, if it was bish bash bosh together, as like, oh, let me get this with the drill, screw the things in, you know, like, th there's a there's a lightness to the making that I kind of get from doing a, you know, thinking about the, an HB, H, you know, uh, eight H pencil kind of thing, the the pre the precision or the lines, but the, the the cut. I'm very particular about whether I chamfer an edge or I keep it clean, mm. and the edges have to be protected at all times, so that, and that is the light. Like, maybe that's the lightness, the the moth, the weight, something to do with weight. Yeah. There's a question at the back. Um, it's interesting to me to speak then about moths and the fact that um, obviously you know, you're moving transport from different locations and a lot of your work has a lot of ties to different locations and you know, sort of extracting them and bringing them into the control of new location where a lot of locations meet. Um, and I find this a very interesting contradiction but in a good way of these objects that then sit in Chile for a long time. Or a stick that's heavy and stays in a, you know, an area like New York flat as things clean up into it. But then you spot the stick that's moving around again. Um, and I'm just wondering, yeah, if there is certain objects you had that you maybe wanted to fuse into your work that perhaps have not wanted to move in that way, or objects that you've come across unexpectedly. Maybe like a door in a gallery space that you don't clock until you've actually got found for sure. I think I think I have um, I have a lot of um, like backsides is one box in my studio labelled backsides <laughs> makes me laugh but um, I the circus comes to clap and common um, and when they're setting up um, when you're walking around you see the backside of of all the things, and it's something that I recognised in a G another Giotto frieze is the the um, the uh, trans is it the transept? Mm -hmm. So you know, I, there's a painting of a cross that's seen from behind the mm -hmm. transept, leaning forward. Mm -hmm. And every time I see the circus signs, I feel like I'm in the Giotto painting. Oh, wow. And that's a really you know, like I I'd love to make a piece of work like that. I suppose the circus is always transitory as well. Comes and goes. Transitory, that kind of thing. Boxes, yeah. They, I, I'm interested in the the thing, the things that you know. This movement is something. It comes out. It's not. It's not a conscious thing. Um, maybe now it will be. You kind of pointing it. But I don't know. It's what I'm attracted to. Things that move. But I do have sort of ideas in in boxes and collect things like. The piles of it. I'm, I'm constantly kind of collecting things that I just look, take a photograph, look, it, put it, and then yeah. So and then for but I do have other ideas like the broken windows pieces that was particular to a place in Preston, and I can see that being being taken somewhere else. Not that particular piece because it was for that space, but the idea could be taken and and. Um, made an, a new piece in another space, so the yeah. But you're not a sentimental person who looks back a lot, is that right? I mean, it's it's really about the the object then leading you forward into a new one. Why you then? I have a very bad memory. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, and uh, yeah, I just suppose I am interested in, in uh, looking back. Mm -hmm. 
No, I'm not sentimental, no. No. How did you get that one? <laughs> Psychoanalysis going on here. <laughs> I think we have um, time for at least one more question. So, uh, yes. Um, one up front, please. I think it's because you, you told the story about um, Rachel Whiteread having um, made a piece after her mother died and finding a box in her house with a description of contents. Mm -hmm. and I think it was in that context that we talked about, mm -hmm. you know, whether your work comes from looking back or being in the present or going forward. I think I think it's always a combination of both of those, isn't it? Yeah. There's all the past always informs and reinforms and things like that. So yeah, I don't know about sentimentality though. I don't know about that. I mm. um, no, it's more raw. It's more raw. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Are, are one of you go on there? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So. So I, I'm the last question, so I'm going to sneak two questions in. But one is not a, a real question. But what, what is that strange obstruction that goes across the left hand side of that painting? I was just looking up. The death of the boy in Sessa. I mean you've got this whole scene going on and then you've got this strange sort of The death of the foreground boy in Sessa. Let's see on the left oh, that strange thing is actually part of the the chapel building. Yeah, That's a bit of the architecture in which the frieze is painted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it kind of goes yeah. into yeah. the wall. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I heard you have this, you know, um, very small voice um, discussion there, which I couldn't hear all of. But we're going into sort of sentimentality and that sort of idea. I, I'm not quite sure what what the um, Questions exactly, but I just wanted to ask you about the idea of origins as opposed to memory. So, I mean, one thing, so you specify, say, that you use Chinese ink as opposed to India ink, and I wondered about that because Chinese ink, India ink is. Chinese I think ink. it's, I'm not sure if the, the, um, when you buy ink, it, it, it is a China ink. That I use. I'm not sure whether I think the Indian ink is probably made in Birmingham or something. You know, like you know, like there's, I think names, you know, like can be um, maybe not what they are. And I don't think it's particularly to do with the fact that it's from China. Um, but it's it's because um, the ink that I use is uh, a pure. Um, soot ink, so it's mm. from uh, lamp um, carbon. So it's pu it's a pure, you know, you lamp probably lamp. know more, more <laughs> no, about it than me. <laughs> but it's a, it's a it's a pure carbon that's suspended in water. And the funny thing is, I use a glass when I'm I'm kind of paint, painting or drawing or whatever you call it. And um, the it's really difficult after a while to get the you know, if it dries, if the soot dries actually on the glass, it's really, it almost etches itself in really? to the glass. It's quite, um, yeah, it's quite a sort of, it's quite sort of strong, strong stuff. And, it, and it's suspended in a liquid, which I think has some kind of natural um, sort of disinfectant thing to it. It has a, mm -hmm. a very kind of a woody kind of resiny mm -hmm. kind of smell. And I actually quite like working with because um, <laughs> like I like the smell um, but yeah it's, it's because it's permanent though and I when when you do the when you do the ink drawings I stretch them afterwards so I actually wet the whole the whole drawing the first time I did it, it scared me at all I thought no this can't be but you can completely wet it and, and yeah, nothing looks yeah. Yeah. yeah it's probably gum apparently the binder. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it has a. would make it stick as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to the yeah. I think we might. Thank you all so 
I realise I hope you've been able to hear what we've been talking about down here. Um, thank you all so much, but thank you, Francis, as well. That was just fascinating. And before we um, clap and thank you again, I just would like to invite everybody to join us up one floor in our research forum for a drink, and we can carry on chatting there. And I think the best way to get there is either the lift, which you passed for, or maybe follow some people who will um, follow the people that stride confidently and they'll lead you up the, up the stairs one, one flight. We'll make sure one of us is, is doing that as well. But Francis, thank you so much. Thank you.